The international system remains dominated by the global north. The global south was largely reduced to being a consumer rather than a producer. They not only did not reap the full benefits of economic change, but often ended up saddled with unviable debts. We cannot be at the mercy any longer of a few suppliers whose viability could come into question by unanticipated shocks. It is, uh, however, an undeniable reality that the international system remains dominated by the global north. This is naturally reflected in the composition of the G20 as well. Perhaps this mattered less when the globalization process appeared to offer more opportunities, but as its iniquities and unevenness became more apparent and then as we saw the COVID pandemic take a horrific toll across the world, the need to focus on developing countries has become more compelling. If that was not enough, the consequences of the Ukraine conflict for global food, energy and fertilizer security has added to complexities. And obviously, trade disruptions, high interest rates and climate events increasing climate events have contributed additional factors of stress. The current focus on the global south emanates from the conviction that these are countries that are truly deserving of special care. But equally, these are also societies under exceptional stress, which, if left unaddressed, would become a serious drag on the world economy. Remember, globalization cuts both ways. Till now, the discourse has largely focused on its optimistic facets, but do consider what the implications are for all of us, north or south, of slowdowns in nutrition, in health, in education, in employment, or even in security. And indeed, when the promises of digitization, connectivity, or technology fall short. When India assumed the G20 presidency last December, we were acutely conscious that most of the global south would not be at the table when we meet. This mattered very much because, as I have underlined, the really urgent problems are those faced by them. To discuss their concerns without providing them a fair hearing appeared extremely unfair. And in and India itself, so much a part of the Global South, could not stand by and let that happen. Therefore, Prime Minister Modi decided to convene the Voice of the Global South Summit in January of this year, we heard from 125 countries directly about their challenges and priorities. And on their behalf, these have been made central to the G20 agenda. Different aspects of these fundamental challenges have been discussed in the finance track and the Sherpa track, or for that matter, the ministerial streams and the engagement groups. And as a result, we have deliberated on the issues of debt and finance, on sustainable development, climate action, food security, and women-led development. The core mandate of the G20 is to promote economic growth and development, and that cannot advance if the crucial concerns of the global south in the areas that I have highlighted are not addressed. But having said that, let me step back and bring out some of the structural issues 
that are today at the heart of the predicament of the global south. Key among them are the concentrations of various kinds created by the last three to four decades of globalization. For a variety of reasons that range from scale, subsidies, technology, human resources, and strategic choices, the global south was largely reduced to being a consumer rather than a producer. Their contribution very often was to provide resources for manufacturing elsewhere. They not only did not reap the full benefits of economic change, but often ended up saddled with unviable debts emanating from opaque initiatives. This was a gradually unfolding crisis in the making, but one that was accelerated rapidly by the multiple shocks of debt, COVID, and conflict. As a result, the endeavor now is to seek a re-globalization that is more diversified, that is more democratic, where there would be multiple centers of production, not just of consumption. And that is where business can make a crucial difference. We cannot be at the mercy any longer of a few suppliers whose viability could come into question by unanticipated shocks. This was stark starkly apparent when it came to health during the COVID pandemic, but it pretty much applies to everything else as well. The compulsion to create more resilient and reliable supply chains is a really pressing one. Its counterpart in the digital domain is driven more by anxieties about trust and transparency. The volatility of the last few years has brought home to us the importance of strategic autonomy. We may talk about seeking a more just, equitable and participative global order, but at the end of the day, that will only happen when we see commensurate investment, trade and technology decisions.